I'm thrilled to say that I'm joined here in the Franzer foyer, which is right next to the small hall in the Concertgebouw, by our esteemed colleague and concertmaster, Liviu Prenaru. Now, Liviu will be playing the solo part in Sibelius's Violin Concerto with the orchestra in this project. And Liviu, thank you so much for joining me for this little chat. My pleasure. You joined the orchestra in 2006. Right. Could you take us, like, way back? When did it all begin? When did you start playing? I started playing when I was six years old, just normally going to school. In Romania? In Romania, yeah. My mom was playing viola in the local orchestra, and I was faced with the choice between, my father was a sport teacher, and uh, the choice was between sport and music. And the argument was that sport, you can do it, you know, at the highest level until the 30s or something like that, but music, you know, we can do it all your life. So that was why I'm still playing this and why I was choosing, choosing the violin when I was six years old. We've been on tour to Romania many times and I can remember sitting on the bus once and you pointing, you said, oh, I used to play football down there and then I'd come up. So, I mean, clearly the whole sports music thing, that was when you weren't practicing, you were playing football, right? Not only, I actually, did many sports. I liked a lot of things and uh, I still do roller skates and I used to do water ski and play squash and play ping pong and play chess. Anything but violin. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very familiar story. Yeah. Anything to get out of doing practice. So at what stage did you then realize, hang on a minute, I can actually do this? Because you had, a, you had a, an interesting, without wanting to put too fine a point on it, it was, you weren't particularly wealthy as a, as, a, as a child. I was never, no. We were a normal, poor family. And I didn't even have my violin at first. You know, I even had a violin from the school. But because everybody was quicker than me, they all got their little violins, little quarter violins, and uh, I was late. So I got my violin not in September as I should have, you know, <laughs> been, but uh, kind of in December. So even there I was, starting a little bit later than, than the other people. Now they, they start like at three or four, it's not even comparable. But uh, you asked me when actually uh, this made a click and uh, I realized that I really want to do that. I tell you when, when I went, went to my first national competition. It's, it was a place where all the young players from Romania were meeting and demonstrate their talents or virtuosity and I was okay at that age, I that was 13, when I was 13 years old. But, uh, you know, I was not from the capital, it's a province uh, city, Craiova, in Romania. And uh, I was curious to meet all these other people and see what they can do. And after that competition, I, it was like a, you know, like a li illumination or, you know, eureka for me. I said, I can do that too. And uh, that, that moment, uh, I, I just got a mention in the, con in the competition. It's under the third prize. It's <laughs> just a mention. But I was playing Rondo Capriccioso. Uh, and, and at 13, that's already something. Uh, that, well, no, just for people that don't know, that's an extremely difficult piece. It is a difficult piece, right. yeah. I never played it since. <laughs> <laughs> but the next year, just to, to summarize and, uh, and to, to see why it made the difference, I just went to the same competition, I got the first prize. And that I knew th at that moment that nobody has to push me anymore to, to study, and this is what I actually want to do. Now, competitions have played quite a major role in your career. I mean, if you, you only have to open Wikipedia and the list of competitions that you have won, actually. <laughs> this. Uh, is enormous, and if not, then you've been placed in the, the major competitions throughout the world. What is it about competitions that attracted you so much? And if you don't do competitions, uh, are you at a disadvantage? Uh, let me tell you, it's individual, it's personal for each person, but I'll, I'm going to tell you what competitions meant for me. First of all, I went to a competition for three reasons. The first one was to study new repertoire and to improve myself because every time you do like 10 pieces or 15 pieces. Right, so they're set by the competition and you have to learn them and that's a... You make a progress anyway. 
Right. Second, uh, actually, the, the result never mattered to me. What mattered was that I wanted to play in the final. So that was playing with the orchestra, which was a rarity in that time. You know, being young and you want to, to get up there on top, you want to play with the orchestra, this was the, the way to do it. Yeah, so I was looking forward to just playing the final, a new concerto. And uh, the third reason was, actually there were four reasons. <laughs> the third reason was to see how people of my age, and when I started going to international competition, from different backgrounds, will play the same piece. It, at that time, it was incredible for me, uh, as a Romanian, to see a Japanese playing Bach. I was thinking, how do they play Bach? It's like me trying to play a Japanese piece. Yes. Uh, how would I play that? And the last and maybe the most important and beautiful reason going to the competition was to meet all these great artists which were in the juries. And I met legends. And I've Come on, you can drop some names. Uh, <laughs> well, I met Menuhin, which later became, became also my mentor. Right. I met Dorothy DeLay, which also, <laughs> you know, I was her assistant in New York, so, and I, I learned so much with her. And, but I, all these other names, like Igor Oestra and uh, Ruggiero Ricci and uh, Alberto Lisi, which <laughs> changed actually my life when I went to study with him. So let's, let's just talk about your teachers and the importance of, you, of your teachers. You, you talked about Menuhin, uh, who, who was not necessarily a teacher as such, but more of a sort of professional mentor. But Delay, you were her assistant. You studied with her and then became her assistant. Yes. How does that work? So, I mean, Delay, can you, can you just explain Dorothy Delay? Uh, the I know Dorothy Delay is, episode actually happened quite late. I was 28. And approaching 30s, you know that you cannot do, do competitions anymore. The limit is 30, it's up for other competitions, 32. But I decided to do one more competition, and that was Indianapolis. And I was in 98, and um, Dorothy DeLay was, was in the jury, and I got silver medal at that competition, but that's not Who important. Won? The, sorry? Who won? Um, an Icelandic uh, mm -hmm. girl, which I forgot the name. <laughs> well, don't even put that. Don't even put that. Don't even put that. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. So, I, the, so Dorothy Delay was yeah. in the jury. After that, what did that mean to you to be playing to Dorothy Delay? Can we just quickly go? Who is Dorothy Delay? <laughs> Dorothy Delay is like the the name when you say when you speak about violin and the violin teaching. She was the 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 absolute authority, and you can. You know, judge that by just looking at uh, her students, students yeah. who are which were Isaac Perlman, uh, Isaac Perlman, uh, Zuckerman, Shlomo Mintz, and Midori, and just to say a few of them. So she was a legend for us, and I'm emotioned just speaking and just mentioning her name because she, you know, made a, also a huge change in my in my my mind. Not necessarily in my playing because going. Uh, to study with her so late, 28, she even asked me, what do you want from me? What, you can play, you already won competition, what do you want from me? I said, um, I'm here because you know how to put order in somebody's mind and I would like to work with you basics. So this is what I want with Dorothy Delay, basics. But and up here or here? Everywhere. Yeah. It's, you cannot do one with, that, with the other without the other. And you know what I told her? It was, that was very, very funny. I told her, I feel like I don't have a good technique. And she started laughing. And <laughs> after all these competitions, I said, no, no, I feel like I, you know, and whenever I, I speak about Paganini, I'm, and you know what she said? Okay, bring me the next week Paganini concerto, number one. Oh my goodness. So I practiced. I practiced also more than the, just the first moment. I, when I went to play for her, you cannot believe how that, that happened. It's like a studio, the pianist was there, I gave her the music, I said, okay, play. And I had to play the whole concerto. And it was like an audition for, for getting a job or something like that. This is how the lesson with uh, Dorothy Tillet was. It was not like I play a bar and I ask, how shall I do here? I said, no, you play the whole thing, true. Wow. 
And, and, and she made just... me, she made me trust myself. And this was her power, that she made everybody start believing in themselves. I seen people which went there shaking like that and went out smiling. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, no matter how your technique is, you will play better. Yeah. And that, that's what she did to, to, to my playing. <laughs> what an amazing yeah. gift. And, and yeah, as, as you say, a legend in the violin industry. So men, you in delay and... I cannot not speak about Alberto Lisi. Can you that just explain to those of us who have not Alberto Lisi, know who he is? Alberto Lisi was the only, probably the only student of Menuhin. And knowing that Menuhin studied with UNESCO, to be, you know, the only student of Menuhin, you know, Alberto Lisi, and I was the student of uh, uh, Lisi and Menuhin, puts me like in a, in a really nice uh, trajectory there. And uh, I have to tell you, this, this was something uh, I cannot even explain in words, but it's like you, you go and then suddenly you have to go not to the right or the left, but to another planet. This is what uh, the meeting, meeting uh, Albert Alessi was for, for me and my playing. Until then, all my teachers were good telling me things and I learned from each one of them. I had like three or four or five before him. But each one had something you know, different and sometimes not, me not agreeing with him. And I had many times restrictions like don't do too fast vibrato, don't do glissandos, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. When I met him, everything was possible. And he was exactly on the same vibration, on, on the same line, on, on the same ideas I was looking for in sound, in interpretation, in relaxation, in doing the, the beautiful uh, glissandos or yeah. these differences in vibratos which you don't hear so much nowadays. I saw all of this you know, in the first meeting with, with Lisi and I said, yeah. my goodness, my uh, idols were always Grumio, Schering and Heifetz, but I, nev I could never meet any one of them. Meeting Lisi, was like meeting all three yeah. in one person. Yeah. And that was, ah, if that moment, you know, you know when you feel like you go out of prison and you feel liberated. That was the feeling when I had with him, when I, when I met him and I saw him playing. Because first I thought, oh, an old man, you know, I was prepared, I was really well in shape, I was after the Tchaikovsky competition when I went to Switzerland. And actually, I went for only a master class for, for 10 days, and I stayed 16 years. <laughs> that that's just says what, uh, and the day yeah. I left to come to the Concertgebo, I said, I still have so many things to learn from you. Yeah. But, uh, but just telling you, I was coming after the competition, I see, I see this old man sitting down there, I say, oh, let's, let's show him how, how to play the violin. So I played beautifully Tchaikovsky and said, do you have something else to play? Yeah, I have also Brahms concerto. And he started laughing, oh, come on. I said, really? Well, okay, play it. So I played also Brahms Concerto, and then she asked me, you want to stay? And I said, look, I still have two years to complete my, my studies in, uh, in Bucharest, at the conservatorium. And you know what he said? It's now or never. And it took me about one second to, 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 to think and say, okay, I'm coming. Wow. So I left everything in Romania, studies, family, friends, school, everything, and went to Switzerland. And it was probably the most fantastic thing I've ever done in my life. And he was Arge Argentinian? <laughs> yes. Which is where can this I, whole connection... <laughs> with can I tell you how he met with Manuchin? And he was actually... Manuchin was in the, in the, during the same competition, the Queen Elizabeth, yeah. and Alberto was coming from Argentina by boat, <laughs> which took for, him for about a, a month. In Belgium. For the competition, for this fantastic competition. Now, there is one thing there in the competition saying that a month before, the competitors will know which one of the Isai sonatas they are going to play. So Alberto going already on the boat didn't know that. So he had to learn all six sonatas, <laughs> which is incredible. It's yeah. like, really, when you know all these uh, yeah. sonatas by Isai. So that's, that's where, where they met. And although he didn't win the first prize, he was, you can still see today, his performance at that, that age. Alberto playing at 18 years old, the Dvoja Concerto. And uh, after that uh, you know, performance, he went to, to ask Menuhin, can you take me as a, as a student, please, as your student? And uh, Menuhin said, look, I don't teach. I don't have students. But you can 
follow me. I, I can take you with me on, on my trips. On my, and that's how they became like, like father and son, you know. And I, I was so touched to see sometimes, some years later, that Alberto sometimes will call me Tonino, which was his son's name, yeah. which says, uh, said a lot to me. And we had a very, very special connection. The importance so. of a great teacher or teachers is essential in, the, in this business. Yeah. I, I, don't, I think it's quite often overlooked. I mean, we all talk about our teachers and you mentors. You cannot replace that. But, 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 it, but it's, it's so very important. And there isn't a single musician that I know that hasn't been massively affected by, in a good or a bad way, actually you need both, to be honest, <laughs> um, by, their, by their tutors. Wow. And I have to tell you, he gave me that violin for the final. I performed on Alberto Lisi's violin for the final in of the, the Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth yeah. But because he had to give a recital, at the end he said, I cannot give it to you immediately, I would give it to you now. But I have to play a recital exactly in that week in which we are all closed in yeah. a castle and have to learn a new piece and prepare the last round, one week. So in the middle somewhere he had to play a recital. There were master class recitals and then he had to do that. And then after that, Somebody brought to the chapel, musical, the violin, and I started practicing the Saint Sans Concerto on that violin. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I have to tell you, the moment I started playing, you know, the how the. When I when I started that in the in the hall, I heard. A, it was because that violin had the most incredible G string you could ever imagine. Well, that, that one's not bad either. It's not bad. It's a, yeah, it's a well, Strad. Well, it's a Strad. <laughs> it's a Strad, yeah. Uh, uh, could you ever have imagined as a six-year-old no, no, in, no, in no. Romania that you would end up being No, you strand cannot there. imagine many things. <laughs> I'm already like, uh, what happened to, to, to this line of my family, you know, that they made a, a jump of like a few generations. I could never imagine that I would, I would live outside Romania. Or not even that I would speak a second language. How many languages do you speak? Just five. <laughs> but it's not just five. It's you're funny in five. And, that, and that's, the, that's the difference. You know, when, you, when you're speaking many languages, you get your one language that you're funny in, and then you just speak the others. But you have a sense of humor in all five languages. I know this because I've spoken to people that have spoken to you. And that's, that's really amazing. Um, now, I could never imagine that. I could never imagine that. So... So you've, you're, you're in Switzerland, you've done all the competitions, you, you are a soloist, and a job comes Part up. Part of my life, yeah. A job comes up in the Concertgebouw Orchestra. Can you just explain to me why you would leave a soloist's and, and teacher's life behind, uh, and uh, an amazing life in Switzerland, and come to be a concertmaster of an orchestra they are two completely different worlds. And, and actually, they're, they're water and oil. They don't actually Sometimes really they don't mix up at all. Yeah. What on earth made you think, I know, I'll go and become a concertmaster? i tell you why. One word, Switzerland. I don't think of why. Switzerland is a beautiful country, but it's so quiet. And for about, you know, all the 16 years I've been there, the only excitement was when I was going outside Switzerland and playing concerts and recitals, which I've done after the Queen Elizabeth quite a lot, a lot, a lot, and then teaching. It was, it was great, but it was too quiet. And I was thinking once, am I being used by this uh, universe at my full capacity? And my answer was always no, I don't feel that. But I was not, not planning to change anything. So when this telephone came from Joel, the he artistic was our, director. Our, our artistic director, yes. yes. And uh, he asked me on the phone, would you like to come and, and be for a week concertmaster of the Concertgebouw? I said, wow, that's a great thing. But uh, I was going to say, but I'm not concertmaster and I'm not going to do that. And I said, but I, I, you know what? Call me in three days. Let me think about, about it for three days, you know, which sometimes you can think, oh, what a, what a big head. Uh, what, it sounds like, like that. Uh, like yeah, this three really. days is a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know what? When he, he called me, called I said, me. call me back in three minutes. 
<laughs> no, no, no. I really wanted to, to, to think about it. And I was thinking, I've done, you know, all these trips and all these concerts and all these recitals. I, I know this life. I, I'm familiar with it. And it's nice. It can go on. Teaching, I'm very happy with it. I've done it for, since I was 20. In that time, you know, I was 35. So 15 years of teaching, it was also very, very nice. But I felt like I'm not using my full potential. And I'm, there were weeks in which I was just going to the lake and looking at the sunset and just being quiet. I've mm. been quiet for too long in Switzerland. Yeah. And then suddenly, this thing came. Since <laughs> this, this came, you know, my, I thought I was being used like 20% of, you know, of the full capacity. My life has, has become like 150% or 200%. Yeah. Can you explain the, the differences? I mean, of course, there's the repertoire and the, the amount of music that you have to learn as a, as a concert master. You not only need to learn the violin part, but it's everything else as well. And, of course, this amazing connection with the conductors. How, can you sum that up? I mean, sum up the job of being at the... Well, you, you, you're at the pinnacle of the orchestra. We rely on you completely as the go-between. But, uh, but it's much more than just that. It's, it's difficult to put it in a few words. You know, people try to write books about that and nobody really agrees because every time somebody goes into that position has to discover his own path. So this is as simple as this and it's not repeatable. repeatable. Did, you find, if, did you find it easy? No, not at all. It was actually more difficult than the other two I've been doing until then. So for me, being on some masses is, in a way, more difficult than being a soloist or, or a teacher. Uh, why? Because let's explain for the people who don't really know exactly how this, this works. When you play solo and you prepare a piece, I give you an example. Dino Lipati was preparing his recital eight months before the same pieces. He will practice them for like three months, then let them, and then take them back again, uh, approaching the recital. And this is what basically everybody does, maybe uh, eight months, maybe five months, maybe three months, uh, depends on, on each one. But it's a long period to learn a piece. And we all do that if you want to really do it well. The difference about that, you know, what happened later on is that every week in an orchestra, you have to change the program. And you can hope that after 20 years you'll know the pieces, but that doesn't happen. Because <laughs> I've been like 15 years, you know, in this orchestra, and still every time I go there, the piece is new yeah. for me. Maybe sometimes we repeat a Brahms or sure. a Mahler, but basically everything is new every week. So that requires an incredible amount of uh, assimilation and uh, uh, speed in assimilation. Because what I've been doing before in months, now I have to do it in hours, in days. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, you finish a concert on Sunday and the next morning, on Monday, Monday morning, you have to do something totally different. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, matter that uh, after three days you already know what is there. Uh, you're not going to quit what you're playing that week and learn for the next week. You are going to do both in parallel. That's why the competitions helped a lot. Because having to learn 15 pieces and keep them in, in your hand, you know, facilitate it. Also, what helps a lot in orchestra, it's a good sight uh, reading, right? Yeah. Prima Vista. I, yeah. I always call yeah. it Prima Vista. And that, that helps a lot. And that was part of one, uh, uh, was one of the uh, exam stages in Romania when you entered the conservatory. Yeah. You know, the Prima Vista. So, that's, you know... Uh, that's a few aspects of what you have to do, but that's not all. It's much more than that. You need to, to keep in shape, you know, all the time, all the time. It's not like you live from the hours of, which you spend on stage rehearsing, which is, you know, a few hours every day. No, after that, you need to go back and repair, repair your technique, because playing in the, in the orchestra can, can be muddy, becoming muddy for, for your technique, and you need to hear very well what you're doing there. You need to be sure of your attacks. You need to also show, but this is very tricky because, you know, when you ask a group, uh, would you like, you know, more showing or less showing, you'll get 50-50. <laughs> so you have to deal sometimes with some really 
conundrums of yeah. how do you call them? Yeah, it's yeah. the, it's the, it's the personality bit. bit. Yeah. But speaking of, of personal things, uh, there are, uh, of course, some advantages with being in the orchestra, especially this orchestra, because your wife is in the orchestra, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. But not only. <laughs> There's many, many advantages. But, uh, but, this, but, I, but I would just say, to make it clear, that's the biggest advantage. Not, not only. I'm, this is, this is like, like a luxury. This, I'm trying to help you here. <laughs> you don't need to. You don't need to. No. No, this is a rarity. I mean, it's very uh, seldom yeah. that somebody you know from the same family is in the same orchestra. But it, it, it happens a few times in our orchestra, and it's fantastic. When that, imagine that we, I got here and my wife got in Hamburg or in Berlin or in some different area. It'll be impossible. Yeah. So we were really, really lucky. And you have a little both, family together now? We got the third member, <laughs> our little girl, Lily, which is Is Lily playing old. the violin yet? We don't know yet. She uh, How appears she? to be good in, in many things. How old is she? Three years old. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's put a violin. You've got one there. <laughs> Livia, she it's, sings. <laughs> oh, she sings. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. Livia, it, it, it's always, for me, sat behind the bass, a, a pure joy to see you play. If, if there's somebody who, who I wish, when I grow up, I want to be the kind of musician that you are. <laughs> That's, that's the, the feeling I always get. It that's just seems too sweet. so... Don't make me blush. No, no but it, it seems so effortless. I know that it isn't, because I know all the stories, but you just make it look like you were born to play and, it, and, it, and you haven't put in a million hours. That was a uh, question practice. I always had. Am I in the right business? I was always thinking, am I supposed to do this? I still don't know. But I'm trying, you know... I like it very much. I, I, I can I answer like that it. for you. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, absolutely. I love what I'm doing, and I consider myself so blessed with, with being able to do this, and in such environment. So, Liv, you, you are a soloist in the Sibelius Violin Concerto. Now, the original of the Sibelius Violin Concerto, I mean, let's just put it out there. The Sibelius Violin Concerto is difficult, right? Hugely difficult. <laughs> right. The original was even more difficult. Yeah. Have you ever seen the original? No, but I listened to it. Right, I because there it. have been, and the reason why the original isn't played is because the family, Sibelius, don't allow it. They've only allowed it very few times. Yeah, it was something awkward there, a yeah. little bit, and I don't know why. So you're playing the, the revised I'm playing the, version. the normal version, with the revised, yeah. Okay, when did you first play this concerto? That's very interesting, because I consider this to be one of my transitions, big transitions, you know, like when you study little things and then suddenly you take something big. This was my, that big thing. I was, for example, to, I don't know how to explain that for the people who don't really know uh, the repertoire of the violin, but was, you know, I was playing Vivaldi concertos, Accolai, Reading, Zeitz, and then suddenly you play Sibelius. I think before that was just Bruch. So this, this was one of the... And I have to tell you, I was quite young when I, when I got this. I was only 15 years old. Did you just say 15? Yeah, but that's late for, the, for today. Today they take it at seven, so. <laughs> okay. No, but uh, at that time I was, I was, and I only learned like two pages at that time because it was, you know, very, but I have to tell you, this was, this for me meant always a jump. It was like the big jump, wow, now kind of I know what music starts to be about. Because until then, you know, you hear like classical things, you know, harmonic, nice sounding, and suddenly in Sibelius you have dissonances, you have uh, differences, you have all these cadenzas and devilish passages, and by the way, a lot change, and it should be like this, <laughs> from my first approach that and today, for example, in, in the technique, I just give a little uh, uh, information. All the octaves in this concerto are being played normally with one four, these two fingers. Can you just, can you just show us? Yeah. One four. But because lately I was asking a lot of fingered octaves from my students and I've been playing myself. 
So you're doing one, three, one, four, All one, of three, them. one, four. The whole concerto, I played it now with finger doctors, and I find it much easier, but you need to be trained in, 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 into doing that. And, so, and I mean, this is a major change to change uh, those kind of fingerings. I know that it seems very little yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for people who don't play the violin, but I can tell you that's a major change. And, and, but of course, that basically sums up the piece, that it's so big that you, you spend a lifetime learning it, and you'll never really get there. So although I kept oh, some things from the original learning, like some like this idea of starting, you know, silent and beautiful. Many things stayed, but many things also changed because later on your technique allows you to go a bit further and to try things like this, a little bit more acrobatic, which seem a little bit, you know, crazy, but at the end they are actually easier. Hmm. So, and when you're playing it, I, what I noticed when when during rehearsals is that it starts, of course, with the orchestra, and then right at the last second you put your violin up and play. Is that something that you've thought about? Or is that just No, but I just don't like to, to artificially prepare something like... <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. it looks a bit silly so now. I was, <laughs> I was just mesmerized about these waves provoked by the violins. And I You don't need more preparation. Well, just gave me chills. You don't, you don't need more preparation than that. You know, I don't need to be there and looking at the consumer or the conductor. You know, so I try to to, to, to take it in a very normal approach and without much uh, scene playing. Yeah, <laughs> interference. Well, it's a joy to hear you play it. Thank you so much. I, I'm really looking forward to the performance and and uh, bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you too.